Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, really big honor to stand here in front of all of you today. Um, I've actually changed quite a bit during my scientific life. I won't touch on everything that we have done in the um, past, but I did start out actually as a uh, developmental biologist studying actually neurobiology in Drosophila, then uh, became a developmental biologist working on plants, and for the past 15, almost 20 years, have been uh, studying plant variation. And this is what I will uh, speak about uh, to you today. And I slightly modified my title here, almost all plants are different from each other. And I'll start out by mentioning the key contributors, um, people who uh, have been contributing to this at the Max Planck Institute, Principally, Dan Koenig, who is now an assistant professor at UC Riverside, and Marco Tedesco, who is a postdoc at UBC. And then you'll see from my collaborators that are quite strong Swedish connections here. So the work I'll discuss today, the six uh, collaborators, two are actual Swedes, Tanya and Magnus, and one of them has at least a Swedish sounding uh, name, um, Joy. So this is the plant that we mostly work with. Um, doesn't have much of an agronomic value, Arabidopsis cyana, one way or the other. It's uh, not grown as a crop. It's also not a terrible weed, even though it occurs uh, quite uh, broadly. It's not a very competitive plant, so nothing that you have to worry about as a gardener or as a farmer. And uh, I just give you this uh, picture here to illustrate the phenotypic diversity. So of course, if we look around here in this room, we all look very different from each other. And so these plants, which were collected all over the world, they all look very different from each other, grown in a uniform environment in our laboratory. And uh, why might that be the case that they look so different? So when we'll look at where Arabidopsis thayana comes from, you see that this plant, the species, grows in a very wide range of different environments. Um, for example, here, North Africa, where it's often hot and dry, but also here close to the Arctic Circle in Sweden, where the uh, growing season is much, much shorter, but there's more rain. Um, here, a quite benign climate near the Atlantic coast and again, a much harsher climate in Central Asia. So obviously, this uh, plant or different individuals have to adapt to uh, these local environments. And this is something that we know quite well for many years, that different species, including plants, adapt to um, local environments. And some of the best evidence, or some of the best examples, come actually from trees, and specifically in trees that grow in Nordic countries in Sweden and Finland, and this is uh, from a review published by a colleague of mine, Uti Savulainen, at the University of Ulu, looking at different uh, um, trees, oak trees, uh, 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 birch and uh, pine and, and spruce, where uh, it's plotted different phenotypes, uh, phenology, um, growth cessation, and so on and so forth, versus the latitude where these plants come from, and these are plants that are grown in what we call common garden as uh, uh, evolutionary biologists. You see that they express different phenotypes, and there's a very nice correlation always with uh, latitude. So obviously they are uh, adapted to growing either at northern or more southern um, latitudes. And so we see similar differences in this plant, Arabidopsis thayana, that we work with. Um, these are seedlings raised in the laboratory. Uh, this is seedling that comes from Cape Verde Islands. This is seedling that comes originally from Poland. You see that this embryonic stem, or hypocotyl, as plant biologists would call it, is of very different size. So these, this one here has a rather long stem, and this one here has a rather short stem. So you might ask what what is adaptive about this, that these stems are so different? Well, um, this has to do with where they actually come from. So let's consider 
a seed that uh, uh, is somewhere in Spain, uh, just uh, covered with a little bit of um, litter. When this uh, seed germinates, the stem first has to elongate and the embryonic leaves or cotyledon have to be uh, folded so it can actually break through the soil. And then only when it has done so, broken through the soil, the cotyledons will unfold. So now the plant has to be uh, acutely sensitive to whether it's still under cover or is above the soil. If the um, leaves would open here when it still hasn't broken through the soil, it would be really difficult to push up further. On the other hand, if it waits too long, once it has broken um, through the uh, surface cover, if it waits too long, then it would be outcompeted by other plants that um, can sense light uh, better. So here for this plant, it will be important that it is not too sensitive to light because if you have a strong uh, solar insulation, then of course you might be a millimeter or half a millimeter from the surface and s already get some, some light. So this plant has to be relatively insensitive to light because it grows in an environment that is uh, very bright. So let's consider a uh, seed here growing in Sweden. Uh, in Sweden, on average at least, the sun is not quite as bright as in, in Spain. And so this seedling then has to be more sensitive to light because it has to react by unfolding its leaf when the relative brightness um, of uh, the sun is lower than it is in Spain. So now if we take these two seedlings into the laboratory, what well, we'd expect that indeed uh, under similar relatively intermediate light, let's say, uh, this seedling here goes on for longer because it's less sensitive to light and waits until it unfolds the leaves, and this one does it more quickly. And we can see here two very interesting phenomena. So the same plant will express a very different phenotype depending on the environment. And this is plasticity of a single individual or a single genotype. And then we see that in a common environment, two different individuals will give a different phenotype, whereas in the adapted environments, they will actually have the right phenotype. And so this is something that we've been studying for the past 15 years. I'm not going to bore you with all the um, details, but there's plenty of environment. These are just uh, 150 or so different individuals from different parts of the world that we have grown under different environments. And you can see that there's always a distribution that some are short and some are, are very tall, and uh, the, on average they are much shorter in white light than if we grow them here in the complete dark. And we've been studying the genes um, behind these and have found genes that are indeed uh, correlated with local adaptation. Now, this might suggest that evolution is relatively simple, that there is an evolutionary optimum. You are in a grow in Spain or in Sweden, and the environment is a certain way, so it's really easy to evolve towards that optimum. Unfortunately, that's not quite the case, and I'd like to illustrate this here with the former governor of uh, uh, the state of California. So in many species, being large is an advantage. Body size is an adaptive trait. In many species, you might think, you know, this is optimal in humans. And you look around the room here, we are not all like Schwarzenegger. Um, the reason is that it's not always optimal. So if we look at this gentleman here, um, he is in an environment where actually smaller body size is optimal. He's a He's a jockey, and from appearances, it seems that he was recently successful and won some prize. So it depends what environment you're in. And unfortunately, environments are not constant. Environments change all the time. And so again, this is something that we've been studying in this plant, Aerodopsis cyana. Uh, you see there's quite a bit of variation in body size. This indicates where these different strains are from, including a strain here from uh, uh, Sweden. In my former student, Marco, when he did this work, he realized that there was a set of strains that were quite small. And not only were they small, but they also suffered from this late onset necrosis where the leaves would die off after the plants had stopped growing. So they are not small because the leaves die off, but the two things were correlated with each other. And this was a strain that came from Estonia and abbreviated EST. So he went on to 
uh, identify the genetic basis for these strains being small and having this late onset necrosis. They also make leaves more slowly than other strains. And he found that there was a single gene that was responsible for many of these aspects of uh, plant phenotypes. So these are different wild type strains. Um, these, for example, are from Billund, um, where you see there is in the wild type a lot of cell deaths. We uh, see this from the blue color. We've stained dead cells with a certain dye. And when we eliminate this ACD6 gene, you see that these dead cells disappear. You only see the veins that, of course, are also composed of cells that die during development. And perhaps even more impressive, see here this has an enormous impact on the size of these plants. So the uh, wild plants are quite small. We eliminate this gene. They become much, much bigger. This, of course, kind of cool for a graduate student to discover a gene, a naturally occurring gene that makes, plan, makes such a big difference on plant size. But of course, it also made us scratch our head. So why would about 20% of all wild strains have this gene or this variant of this particular gene that makes them so much smaller? It wasn't that difficult to figure out. Of course, there was this necrosis um, phenotype. And uh, we, of course, knew that necrosis was related to immunity. It's a typical immune response in plants, as you see in this tomato plant here, attacked by a bacterial um, pathogen. So hypothesis was that perhaps this variant of the ACD6 gene, which we had initially discovered in the EST strain, not only makes plants smaller, but also provides protection against pathogens. So we then, with our collaborators, looked at various antimicrobial compounds, and you see that many defense molecules are at much higher concentration in this EST strain that has this specific variant of the ACD6 gene than in uh, uh, the same strain where we removed the ACD6 gene. These are just two different strains where we've done the same experiment, removing the ACD6 gene. And this is just an unrelated control strain where you see that many quote unquote normal strains in Arabidopsis uh, cyana also have relatively low uh, 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 concentrations of these uh, compounds. And this translates then in more effective defense against pathogen. Again, here this EST strain is essentially immune to infection by this fungus here. We remove the ACD6 gene. They now become is, uh, susceptible to infection. Um, there are other things going on, so this, other, this control strain here is even more uh, uh, sensitive, but that's not too surprising that many genes contribute to susceptibility. Now, being resistant to one particular pathogen, that's, that's, that's okay, but obviously in, there are a lot of different pathogens that a plant encounters, so it actually became a lot more meaningful when uh, we looked at other pathogens and saw that this strain is also resistant to an Ormycete, Hyloponospora, related to infectious agent for potato blight, Phytophthora, uh, resistant to a bacterium that is uh, pathogenic on many crops, Pseudomonas syringae, and even on insects, uh, resistant to insects, aphids. So this then really suggests these plants are smaller, but they are much better defended. And then it depends on which year uh, which genotype is actually advantageous. So if it's a year where there's a lot of pathogen pressure, if it has been a mild winter and it's wet, then it's better to have this EST variant of the ACD6 gene, but in other years it's better to um, have this other uh, variant. So this is sort of an anecdote. This is one case that we observed. It makes a nice story and gets you a nice publication, but in biology, as in other sciences, we, of course, are looking for generality. So is this something that we may observe more generally? And this is where we turn to genome sequences, because genome sequences provide us with a record of what has happened in the evolutionary past of organisms. And um, this is work. I uh, apologize hasn't quite translated from the Mac to the PC, but I think you can still see it. This is work that we have done with uh, Tanya Slotte, where we have been looking <coughs> at uh, variation within three species of the genus Capsella, shepherd's purse, which I'm sure most of you 
will um, know. There is an outcrossing species here, Grandiflora, and then two selfing species. And this selfing species here evolved relatively recently, about 100,000 years ago, from within Grandiflora and perhaps only arose from a single individual. And the length of these branches basically tells you how much diversity there is between individuals. So you see uh, individuals of this species are very different from each other. These are not so different from each other, not so surprising because the species was founded relatively recently, perhaps only by a single individual. And then this species here, which is about two million years apart from the other two, see there's almost no diversity. And we'll come back to that in, in a minute. So focusing on um, these two species um, here, um, what we observe is that many of the variants that we find in this species are shared with this species here. That's not too surprising because they are closely related, so you would assume that genetic variants are found in, in both species. So that, as I said, is, is not such a um, big deal. And I forgot to mention that as an aside, the diversity has nothing to do with geographic range. So the most diverse species actually has the smallest range. Um, so this is not just an artifact of where we have sampled. Okay, so what's more interesting is that these alleles which are shared between different species, we call them transpecific alleles, that they are not randomly distributed in the genome. So for example, on this particular chromosome here, see there's almost no diversity, that's the green line, on one part of the chromosome. And then there are other places in the uh, chromosome where we have a lot of diversity within the species rubella. And many of the alleles that we find there are shared with the other species, Grandiflora. So Dan then looked for signs of what we call balancing selection, where you maintain in the species different, many different alleles in the same place, looked for signs of balancing selection throughout the genome and found that about 2% of the total genome was uh, showing signs of balancing selection, keeping many different alleles. And these 20 or so regions, many of them included immune receptor um, genes or other types of immune genes. So this suggests that indeed what I presented to you before, where the different forms of immune gene maintained in the population, that this is a more general phenomenon. Again, this is just an example of n equals 1, so this could be, uh, uh, could be by chance. So we turn to this other species here and ask this species here, which has lost much of its diversity very recently, we don't know why, but it, but it has, do we see something similar going on? And the answer, yes, it's even more dramatic there, that even though it's 2 million years apart from Grandiflora and Rubella, something like 50% of variants in SNPs, this is just biological j jargon for variants, something like 15% of variants are shared between uh, Orientalis and these other two species. When we ask where these shared variants is, are, we find it's actually the same genes as what is shared between Rubella and uh, Grandiflora, and it's even the same alleles or variants that are shared. So even though the species grows in completely different places, it grows in Central Asia compared to Rubella and Grandiflora grow around the Mediterranean, they again maintain the same variants at these immune receptors. So conclusion there is that the variation at many genes is largely dispensable, and I started out by, with this title, uh, uh, all plants are different. Variation at many genes is actually dispensable, apparently, but variation at immune genes is essential. Otherwise, a pathogen, this makes intuitively sense, can overcome the defenses of that species and lead to its extinction. And with that, I'd like to stop and acknowledge the organization which funds much of my research, the Max Planck Society. Thank you very much.